Welcome to the debut interview series. And if you're wondering, what is the debut interview series? This is the place to be. But many of you already know. It's where we take three amazing storytellers who tell a story for the very first time. You are the first audience. And we bring these tellers so that they share their stories for us. But before that, we, we like to know a little bit about the tellers. And if you already know them, know them a little bit more. We talk about the process of play. Um, we talk about them as a teller. And I am so excited to have this teller with us today. She's based in Ohio. I'm based in Ohio. But her, her and her stories travel nationally and internationally. She finely tunes and crafts a folktale and at the same time honoring the tradition that it was brought in. She tells personal tales um, and she can craft a story in a way that makes you remember it, which is what all storytellers want. She's a friend, a colleague, and a big practitioner and lover of stories. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me bring in the one and only Lynn Ford. Welcome, Lynn. Hi. <laughs> How are you? Doing great, doing great. Thanks well, for having me here. Welcome to the debut interview series. We're, we are we are especially happy to have you here. Thanks. Um, and for those who don't know, I am Kevin Cordy. <laughs> I should probably say that. And it is an honor. Lynn, we've known each other for a while. I don't know how many years. What do you think? Oh, decades now. I know. <laughs> uh, and I do want to share this, that when I moved from California to Ohio, uh, Lynn was one of the first people both to write, speak, and find me and say, welcome back to Ohio. Here's what's going on. We want you to be part of it. Uh, and you were just a beautiful ambassador. If I've never said thank you, I felt welcomed when I got to Columbus. So oh, thank I was... I was glad you were going to be here. <laughs> so let me start with um, what brought you to story? I was born to story. I come from a storytelling family. I'm the fourth generation storyteller that we know of in the family. And my father was my favorite storyteller. Uh, my grandfather, my pop pops, he was my second favorite storyteller. And there's family legend that says that when I was a newborn, my great great grandmother held me in her arms and just started whispering to me. And the legend is that she might have been telling me my first story on this side of the womb. I probably heard them when I was still in the womb. So, literally, you from base one, you've had stories, both yes. being listening to tell, uh, and, and that makes a better teller, I think, definitely. Um, but stories, uh, like within my family, we turn off the television and my mother would say to me, you're not getting up until you hear this story. And so story <laughs> had those special times. It, was that in your family as well? Well, we didn't get a television until I was six. Um, this little black and white <laughs> screen in a huge piece of furniture. And uh, so it wasn't as important to me. And my dad's mother, my grandma Cooper, occupied the, the TV time with uh, wrestling matches. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, so I really wasn't into that. So, you know, when we finally did get our own TV in our own home, um, I was very much interested in things that told a story, even if it was a cartoon but I really wasn't much into TV because by that time, now my mother was watching the soap operas and that wasn't a story I wanted either. I know that we were glued to the set so much that for seven years, I, I decided I would not have a television. And I was teaching high school at the time. I can't tell you the number of parents that would come in or students and say, I want to give you this television. 
because oh. they couldn't see the world. I remember one particular mother had this giant television. She opened the back of the trunk and said, my son said, you don't have a TV and I have to give this to you. We have one for every room, including the bathroom. <laughs> I came from addicted to television. I had to break it. Or I yeah. didn't think I would know story that, quite as well. Because storytelling, television can't replace a storyteller, right? No, no. It's a, it's a fixed entity. The story isn't going to adapt to the people who are uh, listening to it. It's going to be the same way. Um, so if you like the story, there are always reruns of things. But if you felt like there was something wrong with the plot or the pacing or the characterizations, you can't do a thing about it. Um, as a, as a listener, um, you're stuck. You're just stuck with that fixed image and fixed dialogue. Whereas if a storyteller is in front of you, the storyteller tends to adapt to the story participants and it, it's communication at that point and a whole different thing for your heart. You feel connected to the storyteller. Um, some people are connected to the screens, yes, but that's not the same sense of being and it's not as healthy as if you just listen to a, a real live storyteller. There's some distance involved. Like you said, it, it, it's connected. I know that someone said, how can an ADHD, whatever title or label you want to give, listen to a story for 45 minutes, but not listen to someone teach for 45 minutes? And I had to think about that. And I said, you know, because the characters can go as slow or fast as they want in their head. Uh, how do you feel about that? Well, there's a big difference in making that connection. I've noticed that children who are differently abled will observe my face, the facial expressions. They'll watch my gestures just as attentively as other uh, young people, but more, I think, more so it, it helps them to understand the story. And the characters on the screen don't do that. And when I find those connections, I can play with them and make that person a participant in the story. And so they feel involved. There was one event where um, the child kept coming over to sit at my feet and listen to stories. And I mean, sit at my feet. He was practically on my feet. But um, he, they would go someplace and do some other activity. He'd come back and I'd tell him another story. Then he'd get up. He didn't stay for two at a time and he'd go do something else. And then he'd come back for a story. And his mother told me that he thought I was um, the story lady from the TV show. Uh -huh. um, but, you know, and we looked nothing alike. It was just the fact that I was sharing a story and he could come back and see me again what she was doing was rerunning the stories so he would come back and to me that was so special because i was already a friend since he thought i was the story lady but he was willing to come back and listen to new stories each time not reruns so i feel like there was a really strong connection you don't get that when kids watch the screen i know i was in farmington new mexico and the, the differently abled students were in the very first row. And uh, there was one student who was primarily nonverbal, very young, young child. And I was telling a story, and, and you know those stories that demand a physical body? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and this was a, a tale about a, a cat that goes 70 miles per hour, you know, and so I'm moving, you know, gasoline cat, <laughs> the old folk tale. And, and this kid stands up and hugs my feet <laughs> <laughs> and will not let go. And I'm running, you know. And, and, the, and the, 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 the aide was yelling and I said, no, 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 no. And you have to do this with Anna. And, and and, and I just slowed the story down. It was the slowest, fastest cat in the world, you know, and, <laughs> and, and I let him hold on. And I talked to someone later because I, when I was working and said, you know, that's the best way that they could honor the story for you, that you reached so much that you moved there. And I, 
I, I think the story that you just shared is the same thing. Yeah. That connection. Yeah. You're the story lady, and this is reaching out. Oh, yes, yes. And another little boy walked over, and he just touched my cheeks. And so I gently touched his shoulders. And then he went back and sat down and his teacher was crying. And afterwards she said, he doesn't like to be touched. Um, so we had already touched at the heart level, you know, from the story. And he felt comfortable enough and calmed and soothed enough that he would come over and greet me and make me a part of his little circle, you know? And you can't have those moments when kids are just looking at a screen. That's why for me, I'm so glad that the world is opening up more and we don't have to do everything in the Zoomiverse at the same time. Um, it's still not, um, you and I were talking before and you asked about normal, you said something about normal and it's still not normal, quote unquote, but it's getting better. And I think especially for the children, even if they have to wear masks, it's better to have that almost physical and personal connection with any of their mentors than it is on the screen. And Lynn, you're not, um, you are, I don't want to say more than or just a, you are a storyteller and educator and researcher and all kinds of things. But as an educator, uh, wouldn't you think that we need to touch each other more within the context of stories within our curriculum? I think stories should be mandatory. You know, <laughs> love it. Yeah, <laughs> I can't force Stand it. For superintendent of education. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like every school, at least in the elementary uh, grades, should have a storyteller on site. I think that should be part of. Um, the uh, mentors in the school, a storyteller on site in every elementary school. Doesn't mean that they can't be in high school too. It's just as important there, but I'm thinking budgets. But I think no, that- No, 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 no. <laughs> From the high school of me teaching in high school and, and middle school, there needs to be the same. It needs no, to be the same. worry about the budget, that story, I, I think you're gonna say it. So I'm gonna let you say it, how much story answers. Well, it, um. Every aspect of the curriculum can be enriched, can be informed through story. I don't care if it's math or science or um, English language arts or uh, visual arts. Um, story touches every aspect of the curriculum in one way or another. Um, for math and science, story is an if-then process. If this happens, then this must happen. That's problem solving skills and kids need that for social emotional development too. Um, we always had math story problems, story problems. That's what they're called, right? Story problems. And you had to solve the equation, figure out the equation and solve the problem to get to the answer. So, you know, if you turn it into a story and then put the math in, not just a story problem, which has such a negative sound to it, if you made a story and then in included the math gently through it, I think some kids who think they hate math would find out that it was very interesting. And those who are more oriented towards spoken word might learn more effectively if the math was wrapped with story. Um, I can't think of one thing, including physical education, that can't be enriched with story. And Lynn, uh, you're not only just speaking from your own experience, you collectively um, studied and have collections of books that address special needs with our friends. Um, uh, Sherry Norfolk is a collaborator and Jane Stetson. Um, and so we want to definitely um, invite people to come and see your work and I'll put a link up there. Um, but, but also that practice. And I, in my research, would state that we not only want to use story as curriculum, we want to use story as the response to curriculum. I want students to talk more in story. What, what, what do you think? Are you finding that or... Um, at the universal level, as if we know everything in the universe, but at the universal <laughs> level, um, basic storytelling is communication. 
any child who tells you something about his or her day is telling a story. They're not taught that that's storytelling. So I think a growth mindset towards storytelling is important um, for the mentors, for the parents, and for the children. Um, if you can encourage a child to feel comfortable sharing their point of view, if you can encourage the child to feel comfortable responding to a question, they're going to be more effective communicators. They're going to be much more comfortable in their teen years in sharing, you know, not being concerned as much about peer pressure and being um, comfortable sharing their own voices. So, yeah, I think responding in story is what a child should feel comfortable doing, but they have to have models of that. It has to be encouraged. It's a natural set. You know, honestly, sometimes I think we artificialize learning when we forget that story is a response. Yeah. Uh, any, if you've been in a preschool, any child might run up to you, you know, with that, hey, 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 I want to tell you something. I want to tell you something. It's important to let them tell you something, you know. Um, you might have to tell them um, we have to speak a little quieter because I can't really understand when you're saying it that loudly. Um or, uh, well, right at this moment, I need to talk to mommy. Can you take 10 jumping steps and <laughs> jump back to me? And I'll try my best to be ready for the story. You know, be flexible, but give them their voices. They, they deserve that. And you're lucky if they say, I want to tell you something. They might start with, you know, my dog has the hiccups. <laughs> oh. We just stay there. <laughs> and that happens a lot when I'm in libraries, you know, because because the children feel that I'm communicating with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis, regardless of how many children are there. They start telling you things that in their mind connect to the story or they just need to tell somebody something and you're there and you're talking with them. So you get to find out about the dog eating up their shoe or something like that. Yeah. Whether it has anything to do with anything else, they want somebody to listen. But I would venture to say that same zeal of wanting to be connected is in adult audiences, but in secret. You've probably had plenty of times that someone comes up that's pretty quiet and says, I need to tell you. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Why or, do you think that that's there? Why do you think that there's this this landscape of invitation in story? We build a rapport. Um, I don't know any storyteller with a narcissistic attitude <laughs> <laughs> who remains a storyteller that people want to hear. The storytellers who know that they're also human beings, and that they're sharing something that has been around since the beginnings of speech, and before that, um, writing on the wall, so to speak. Those are the storytellers that build a, a kind of fan base for themselves, and people feel comfortable because you've become a part of their group. doesn't matter who you are. You're a part of their group because you shared story with them, and so now that you've had your turn, their heart feels it's, it's their turn, you know, or you've jogged a memory that is so urgently needing to be expressed that they have to tell you that story. And I try my best to listen to every one of those stories. You know, sometimes you have to run from one stage to the other, but people deserve to be recognized for their stories. Len, one of the most gracious pieces of advice you ever gave me, which I follow religiously, is answer inquiry, all inquiry. If someone, whether it's an email or someone talking, and it might be no, you might be, just say no, but everyone deserves a response. I don't even know if you remember yes. saying that to me. but I don't, but I, <laughs> I firmly believe it. Yeah, yeah. And the same <clears throat> with story spaces. I always say that the, the best storytellers are the ones who arrive early and leave late. Because story begets story, and we need to be there for that. Um, yes. And and so that leads me um, 
you know, some people think, oh, well, when you get to whatever level of, of story, you're no longer looking for the articulate design of what it is or playing with it or making the story. But um, I would venture to say that we're better storytellers when we're in community of storytellers and listeners and we talk about the process. What do you think? Well, we need to be with the ones who support us. And we need to be with those who, even if they don't understand everything, they understand us as storytellers. Oh, yes. You know, um, you have your support group and it becomes, uh, in a sense, a family, an extended family. And we need to, as storytellers, we may be isolated when we're working on the beginnings of a story, but we need to bounce the story off of someone to talk about the de growth and development of the story. You can't be a storyteller without a story listener. Otherwise, you're just talking to yourself. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, we need some kind of support system and being willing to play and also being willing to listen to those who might be able to give us some some coaching. I don't I don't feel like I do critiquing of people's work. It's it's coaching, encouraging from them what they want their story to be. So I call coaching uh, story mediating, where we work together to find the best direction. And I've mm -hmm. had the hard coaches. I've had Chuck Larkin when he was living to look over and I, my students, like 80 of them was watching me being coached with a hard driven Chuck Larkin. You get it. And, and at the break, they all came up to me and said, who is this man? And we're going to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you have to be ready. And then I, you know, I've had amazing people like Doug Lipman, who is deep into appreciations. And I think that the uh, more of the value of what works uh, can move a story even more. But mediating a story is working together to find where a story uh, can go, not necessarily needs to go. And mm -hmm. so how is play in the work that you do? In what way do you play or define play? Well, it's funny that you said mediating. I, I call it facilitating <laughs> or, or coaching, but facilitating means making it easier. And I don't think people understand the roots of that word are in Latin. And um, uh, facile means easy, making it easy. So I try to get people to relax. And I'll use some laughter exercises or some silly thing, uh, some call and response um, with some stretches and gentle movement to get everyone to relax a bit if it's with a group. And if it's someone one-on-one, um, -on -one, I still get them to do some deep breathing and we do that together and we get kind of silly and the barriers start to go down. And they're willing to play with ideas. Once I've got them to a relaxed point, the child's heart begins to reveal itself again. Um, and they start so to play with ideas. create a permission ideas. place. Yes, yes. So that they're willing to play. Um, again, they don't, you, you can't grow with a fixed mindset. So um, I encourage them to see everything as rough draft, always in process, which means you can always play with it. I've got stories. The only way the stories are fixed is if they've been published, you know, if they're in print. And even and then that's, they're not exactly. That's fixed. one version. Yeah, right. one fixed yeah. way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you may never hear me tell it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I've had those. It's like, oh, I published that, but you know, it's changed yeah. so much. <laughs> and it's funny yeah. that you mentioned uh, fixed mindset. Uh, Carol Dweck's work. Uh, is great, um, you know, with, uh, and I've developed some of those ideas for narrative mindset. So I'm literally working on daily practices to uh, what I said, uh, respond in story, think in story, because story is a meaning making process beyond performance. And even when you're telling, you're, you're constantly making meaning, aren't you? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um I, I don't know how other people's minds work, but my mind is going through the process of the story. You know, I can't speak for anyone else, but it's going through the process of the story. And let's say there's an important point that I should have put in, should have inserted down the path behind me a little bit. Well, with a, 
a flow and a comfort with the story, I can go back, pick that up, ease it into the story, and nobody knows that I dropped it except me. You know, maybe my husband because he's heard some of the yeah. stories. You know, ah, uh, wait a minute. Yeah, <laughs> you you left out the part. You know, but um, but mistakes yeah. reveal, don't they? they oh they yes, give you a new direction. And it sometimes it has shown me, um, for example, that that part wasn't needed that I could revise the story, perhaps shorten it, because whatever I dropped really wasn't essential. It was just, I thought it was, till it was gone, you know, and then it takes a different path. But that comes through practice. I I, I know a little bit of your story. You started very shy, if I remember right, and sometimes you still consider yourself shy. Um, Yes. (laughs) and, And which, you know, no harm, no foul there. Uh, and, you know, when I first started telling stories, I was like word for word learning from an audio cassette. Where did you learn that it was OK to go back, to rewind, to listen more to the audience? How is that process for you? Where, tell us about those transitional. Things. Well, honestly, I think it came from my pop pops, <laughs> who was um, some would say he was a tall tale teller. Grandma Joe said he was just a liar. Um he would start on a story and leave out something that might have been there before, you know, and being a child, I'd say, pop up, but you didn't say. And he would just say, don't need to say it. You already know it. <laughs> you know, he'd just ad lib something. <laughs> or I'd say, but last time, and he, well, we're not in the last time, we're in this time. <laughs> and so, I love it. You know, so I learned you could play with the ideas. They didn't have to stay fixed. Um, There might be some parts that would need to be um, the same way, memorized, in order for the plot to continue effectively. But once you had the basic spine of the story, the basic bones of the story in your head, you could flesh it out in so many different ways. And so I think he was a big influence on that. And then working in preschool, I was a preschool teacher. Um, oh, for a long time. I'm old and I don't even <laughs> remember how long. But, you know, if a child says, um, that's not the way it goes and inject something into this, interject something into the story. I wasn't somebody who'd say, well, the book says, no, we'd go with that. Whatever it was, we'd go with that and have a whole different story. And some would be hilarious you know, and bring so much joy that I'd hear the children telling their parents this story that was nothing like, for example, the three bears or something like that, as they left, which to me was much more important than they knew word for word, some book version of the three bears. Right. Making the experience alive. On the other end, I, you know, I just listened to Liz Nichols at, at the National Storytelling Conference talk about time slips and working with Alzheimer's. And I'm reading about how important it is to stay in the imagination. My mother-in-law is currently a slight dementia. um, That it's not as important to recall the exact, but to give permission spaces to imagine and to agree with that. I think storytellers collectively can learn so much from what you learned in preschool, uh, or from teaching school, preschool, and from your papa. (laughs) Um, And, you know, I always say that uh, Appalachian Roots... Uh, you know, gives a leg up to story. So you are like me. I've got some Appalachian blood. You've got some Appalachian. Uh, you also have Afrolachian and native blood. Um, can you speak a little to that? Because I think that helps frame us as storytellers as well. Um, Afrolachian is a word created by Frank X. Walker, who is still a professor in Kentucky, and he was the very first African American poet laureate for the state of Kentucky. Um, it means African American Appalachian. And he wanted to remind people when he created the word that our families are part of the hills and valleys of Appalachia, too. So you have stories that perhaps someone else may have heard, such as a jack tail. But in my family and in many other Appalachian families, it was touched by a different um, experience of being in those hills and being with people. And there's an impact that can be connected for me back to the Underground Railroad, um, 
as well as to the great migrations, as I did my research on some of the stories from my family. Um, we also have the Scots, Irish, German, French, English part of the family. And of course, the Scots, Irish, and English jack tales were just a part of all of that. So there's a connection through the stories, but it's not the same. And then the Cherokee aspect of storytelling meant that there was a different voice for it. And stories can be sacred. And stories might be told only in your particular family. You didn't share them outside the family. Um, and so I learned that there's both a spiritual aspect to storytelling as well as um, an informative and educational aspect and that sense of humor and touch of heart that everyone needs to feel. So yeah, all, all my family's heritage is in what I share with people. It's interesting what you say about the Jack Tales. Now, I was raised with Jack Tales without ever being called Jack, and I think you're saying that a little bit as well. Joseph mm -hmm. Sobel says that Jack uh, is every man, and, and as you know, I, I wrote a book called You Don't Know Jack, a storyteller mm -hmm. goes to school, and, and so I feel very close to Jack, but I wasn't raised with this is Jack and the robbers, but I heard the robbers. And, you're, mm -hmm. and you, you heard Jack Tales in the, in the Cherokee, you, uh, the, the equivalent. Um, well, blended. The stories were kind of blended right. together. Yeah. And it wasn't just, there was Jack, but there was Big Jack, Little Jack, um, Soldier Jack, John, Simon, Janie, which I love. There was a little girl, you know, and sometimes she was just called Little Girl. So, yeah, it, once I traced the stories, I could find some were rooted in West African folktale, um, but blended with other stories. And some were uh, from uh, mostly the British Isles, but blended with other story. And um, those tales of rabbit. Oh, yeah. Um, we didn't have Br'er Rabbit. He wasn't called Br'er. He was just Rabbit. And then there was Ms. Rabbit, and there was Sis Rabbit, and there was Miss Molly, you know. So I, that to me is a, a family connection to the stories. And if your papa was telling it, he'd say, but that was a different time. We're in this time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was that time. We're, we're in this time. Yep. <laughs> so it sounds like you became a deep listener and you were a deep listener from the beginning that you understand the value of play both in schools um and and, and that you're constantly how how are you challenging yourself now whether with play or not what what do you see as the next challenge for yourself as a storyteller well i'm working on telling more stories in adult living facilities uh -huh. Um, similar to time slips, but through um, the Ohio Arts Council, there's a project reaching out um, for creative aging, and I've been accepted into that, which means I'm going to be using my storytelling and some of the same stories, probably, but in a way to help, as you were saying, with imagination and continued creativity, um, um, memories, but it's not like they have to have something memorized or that they'd have to remember something at all, perhaps a new experience through the story. So that's my big challenge to myself right now, as well as um, I'm, I don't know that they'll become a book, but I'm working on what I call granny tales, um, older women and men, and they're what you could learn from them sure. um, that, that should be still should be honored. Um, I'm hoping to get a lot of spooky stories <laughs> into that. But right now what I'm researching are old folk ways, um, things that I don't necessarily remember completely. And with um, almost all the elders gone, I have to do some research and talk to some other people about them. And there are still people practicing some of those folk ways. And oh my goodness, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and sometimes they don't realize they are, or or someone observing them don't know that you know this this is from the farmer's almanac from way back or what. Oh yeah. The case. Those are beautiful. I mean, why 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 live? Why not seek the past? Why not 
learn from what was there. I mean, the rabbit taught you and the folkways will as well. And yes, and you mentioned spooky stories. I also want to give credit for the ghost story collections that you make and tell, um, whether it's at the National Storytelling Festival or in your backyard. Uh, you know, you can you can chill the spine. <laughs> I love doing that. Thank you. <laughs> sure. No problem. Um, Lynn, why debut? Because it'll give me a chance to play with um, fellow storytellers, um, my people, as Andy Offit Irwin says, um, <laughs> and get some feedback on what might be working. I'm still not sure which story I'm going to put together because I know it's a com it's a um, it's a story that's embedded in a story sure. um, so I I can always use feedback we can always learn hopefully we're always willing to grow and I can't give myself the best feedback for myself it has to come from an external source mm -hmm. and whether I use it or not that's up to me, yes, but at least gather all the information that I can, all the feedback that I can, and it should feel like play. So debut uh, is a chance for me to play with my peers. And we can't wait to to play uh, and, and at the same time get feedback from both the tellers and all the people watching. And I love what you just said. You can't give yourself the best feedback in the way that you could if you played with others and right. you know as storytellers we need to remember that sometimes the only impression that people have is the storyteller on the stage you know it's like the one time that i was teaching a graduate level storytelling class and the woman said oh uh, and and told a story and got an amazing feedback and she said now i'm a professional storyteller after that one story <laughs> Uh, and we had to have a long talk about the practice and the discipline and, and, you know, and she listened and realized it goes beyond that one story. Oh, it, definitely. It's a community. Like you said, my people to borrow from Andy, <laughs> but we need to get him on here to play as well. Um, it, 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 when is debut? And I'll put it up if you don't remember. <laughs> um, when is ours? The uh, last Sunday of the month. It's yes, it's always the last Sunday of the month, isn't it? I want to it? say the 29th. I didn't even look before I asked that question, but it's see, all right. You're supposed, to, <laughs> <laughs> you're supposed to know too. Let's see here. Uh, Sunday, the 29th of August. Good, good. I was right. I had to look on my paper. <laughs> Lynn, I so appreciate the journey that I've seen you move with story, the ones I don't know about, the people that you're constantly helping. And, and just, I mean, you, you've taught me, and I thank you for that. And I so appreciate and value how much you give to play, but also give to the community of your people. And I'm glad to be part of your people. Good naturally oh, well. calling you my, my, my sis. <laughs> well, thank you, little brother. Thank you. <laughs> and Ms. Lynn Ford, you have the last word. Always understand how important your stories are. You are the only one who can tell them. Your stories, both personal and chosen as fiction to share, will make a foundation for someone else, will connect you with others, will nurture creativity and imagination, and will help this world to become a family. Once we've shared stories with one another, we can't be enemies. And what we need are friends and family.